Hey everybody, this is Jeff Livingston and I'm here with my friend Amber Ivy. Amber, how are you? I'm doing great. Hey folks, super excited to be here today. Jeff, thanks for having me. Oh man, we're delighted. And I'm also delighted to have you as keynote for Association AI Day. For those of you that don't know Amber, she's vice president of a nonprofit. Uh, she's worked in state and local government where she was ma managing massive amounts of data. And she's also a podcaster like me. Oh, yeah. All right. So this should be a good conversation. And it's the Friday before Halloween. So yeah, it's all, all good things coming together in one place. <laughs> That's right. Um, so one thing and the reason why we were interested in you as a keynote was that, you know, your experience, obviously, as a data professional, mm -hmm. uh, but also like associations, you know, when you were working, it was Maryland, right? State mm -hmm. government. Yes. You were dealing with very domain specific data. So you had large sets of, I believe, health data that you were managing and interacting with for the benefit of a very specific constituency, mm -hmm. the, you know, obviously the citizens, but that's a lot like an association which manages a very specific set of data for a very specific constituency members. Can you tell people a little bit about that background? Yeah, so I had I didn't have health data, but other colleagues I worked with had health data. But we had edu I had education data, data around energy, Apologies. climate. No, you're totally fine. Energy, climate, um, tax assessments. Like we all were assigned different agencies to work with across the state. So the agencies I work with were in those different domains. So it was very interesting because one, I could go real deep in education data one day, and then the next day go real deep in energy usage. Um, and, and effects on climates and things like that. So one of the things that I really loved about it was that I was able to focus on these large data sets and analyze them to bring insights, not only to the cabinet level secretaries and their staff, but also to the governor and the governor's staff to say, hey, what's happening here? What are the numbers saying? How can we actually attack some of the problems we're trying to accomplish in the governor's goals to improve what is happening here? And the way that program was set up was really focused around the governor had goals, just like association have goals, right? And then we were using the data that was being collected by the agencies in the administration of their programs, which is what or associations should be doing, right? They're collecting data on how they're how they're doing things, on what's happening within their business, internal and external, and really trying to figure out how do you make better, in our case, government's decisions for people or business decisions for associations, and how do we change the metrics to improve things? And with those data sets, we were able to like reduce how much energy was being used in the state or improve the number of houses that were being assessed for taxation. Maryland's a weird place where we do it at the state level versus the local level, or how many kids were taking um, AP classes or, or graduating and what the rates were. So we were able to literally take a data set and zoom in on a goal and then help the goal, help reach the goal because we had data that was backing that goal. So one of the things that I think associations uh, really have to do a lot of is informing and advocating. So they inform yes. membership or they inform mm -hmm. large swaths of the population on behalf of the membership. And then they also advocate uh, uh, for the membership and sometimes with Congress, sometimes with the general public. Right. Uh, did you find that the information that you were using within those those trends and those technology, um, uh, well, it's not technology, those data sets, if you would, mm -hmm. uh, did you find that those agencies would then use that to inform and advocate? Exactly right. So yeah, it was, for me, it was like the perfect place to advocate because you had an analyst who was working directly with you. And that analyst was often showing you stuff in your data you weren't even paying attention to because you had outside eyes who were coming in and supporting. They had internal data anal analysts we work with, which helped them bolster their skill sets. But then we could use that to put that in front of the governor, to put that in front of the legislature or what have you to make real changes. Like I remember being um, in meeting rooms where they, one organization was trying to pilot a new program that they really were trying to do. They had not gotten funding. We were able to bring it in front of the governor with the data backing it and the governor's um, office funded the program and they were able to pilot the program and try some really cool technologies that we hadn't been able to, um, to try. We were also part of like working groups that were designated by the legislature to try to push and move ideas and things that were happening. So the big thing behind data is not only getting things done, but you can also communicate to other folks, to people to get other things done. I know other folks were working on things like the opioid epidemic. 
that was huge with people being able to lobby around how we change and how we even lobby the governor around how we move some of that work. And even the next governor that came on, the first thing they did was look into how can we um, improve the opioid epidemic because there was all this data and information that had had existed. And we were able to pass that data right along to them to help further the process. So I really believe that data is a huge part of advocacy and not just data, just the numbers, but the stories behind the data and telling a comprehensive um, taking storytelling and using other skill sets are very important when you're using data because it's more than a data point. Those are people behind every single number and you have to be able to share the stories of those people so people just don't see individuals as a graph or as a metric, but telling the story of the mom who came to you who lost their son due to um, a heroin, heroin of, um, overdose or even now fentanyl and things like that. You have to be able to tell the story behind that. And associations have so much data that they have access to in groups of people and stakeholders that they can elevate that data in a way that's meaningful. Right. So when uh, w- one of the associations that everybody seems to know is the Consumer Technology Association because oh, right? yeah. of the CES show. And, uh, you know, and I, They're pretty transparency. I started my career there way back in the, oh, nice. you know, yeah, they were they were not called that because it was medieval times, but no, uh, I'm just okay. kidding. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it was the nineties. But uh, uh, long story sh- short, they had like a ton. Of, they had a, yeah, it was only one dot of them. They they had a ton of content. They and they still do. They have tons of uh, uh, of articles, standards, advocacy types of stuff. Stuff that they put out for consumers to educate consumers. Um, they have the show content that they create. I mean, obviously CES is a massive 120,000 person odyssey with media all over it, tons of media coverage about them. And and now we're in this crazy generative er- era, right? Where it's not just hard data like ML can chop up and do all the analytics and trend stuff, but now we can chop up all the other types of content pretty easily, oh, yeah. relatively, crawl mm-hmm. it at least, and then spit it back out with generative right. And then uh, then there's the images and everything. So like basically like this huge Band-Aid has been taken off and, and whatever you can imagine right. is possible. Yeah. What do you think associations like CTA can do with AI now? Oh, yeah. I really believe it. the opportunities are endless. And what I would say to folks who are thinking about how they're going to use generative AI is to really pull people together, pull their staff together, pull external um, stakeholders together and talk about what could they imagine. Because one of the things I don't like about the current moment, everyone's just copying each other and not getting yeah. creative with it. They're all like, oh, we're going to use this for chat box. We're going to use this for image creation. I'm like, that's, yeah, sure. That's what's happening or, or other use cases around that. But let's push it even further. How can we truly use this? Like, even my voice is trained, uh, AI is trained on my voice and um, through a group called Create Labs. And she goes and she speaks across the, the country talking to people about technology. Underlying um, is uh, chat GPT or excuse me, GPT-4 is her underlying um, uh, processor or what have you. But now she's speaking Spanish and she's able to teach people in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, not a lick of Spanish, um, but she uses my language. So imagine even using something like that to go to other countries and the language that these folks are living in to teach them about technology in a different way. And you don't have to physically go there. You can do all type of creative things with technology. Um, The other piece about AI is like, there's levels of, we use the word AI really loosely. So I'll use it the way we use it. But AI in its real form is not what we're doing right now, right? It's no, 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 we're not. This right. is so algorithmic, totally right. Yeah, and but like you can't tell the cat's out of the bag, man. It's gone. Yeah, it's like we're not, yeah. we're not at <laughs> we're not there in what artificial intelligence truly means. Like we're not at that point. But the pieces of like large language models, natural language processors, all of that stuff, I would definitely be using my data sets that I have within my association to help improve what I'm doing in my business and get very clear on using my data sets to train AI to not only teach my members, to help my members get exactly what they need. There are a lot of folks who, even a few folks came to me about, how do I take what's in my association or in my organization and use it? Because right now folks have like SharePoints and things like that, but people are spending 60% of their time, I think the data says, on finding information just to do their job. That is ridiculous. Like that is a lot of um, lack of productivity. And if we can give people what they need, even at the base level, that is a great use of it. But I really want folks to be innovative and think about what is the 10-year version of that. Like think about the fact that iPhone came out in 2008 and where we are today. 
where are we going to be in 10 years is nowhere near what we're doing right now with these technologies. And I want us to get creative and really bring folks in the brainstorm around that. Because otherwise, we're going to be behind. <laughs> and other countries, such as China, have been playing around using this, these things in a way that's more innovative than we are. And I want us to get more innovative and just try things out. Of course, within um, like within a, a box of like safety and let's make sure we do it in the right way. But we need, we got to try things out to see what the potential really can be. Yeah, that's really a good point. And I know competitiveness is a big issue for a lot of associations that oh, yeah. represent American companies, you know, right. depending on whatever the sector is. Um, in that vein, and I, I guess this will be the last question because we don't want to steal all your thunder before this, the actual oh, day yeah, of the event. Oh, yeah, you got to come to the event. <laughs> yes, got to show up. Um, be there but, you know, or don't be there and you'll miss all this great stuff. <laughs> what's your quickest tip to just like for people that seem to be afraid or like just don't know where to start? There's just so many stories and it's like every day there's something new. It's like, what what's the easiest way for people to get in? And please don't say chat GPT. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. <laughs> No, where I would start, <laughs> no, what I would start is I always tell people wanting to start at places like this where you have podcasts who are talking about the issues and, and doing that. Because some of it's just like exposure to what's happening. I yeah. play around with a lot, a lot of different AI. So I literally get news updates from things like This Week in AI or what have you and sign up I for I love that show. The, yeah. So that's every, a great pod. Yeah. yeah, it's a great podcast. They also have a newsletter. So every week I'm seeing what's happening and I go online. And I just play with it because a lot of the stuff is free, which is crazy that you're getting things that are, are free and people can use them to make money off of them. But a lot of stuff is free that you can play with. And it hurts me when even now people aren't using even I know you said don't say chat GPT, but a lot of people, they use it for a second and then people they stop come using back. it. They don't go back. Yeah. They have being with Microsoft, like the integrations there. Microsoft Copilot is um, a technology they can use that can help you with your productivity. Everybody's got a Copilot right. now. Like, I know, it's something. like crazy. Like LinkedIn, right. so, I mean, uh, I think uh, GitHub's got Copilot for coding. You know, yeah, they anyway. do, exactly. So all these places that normally you already have some subscription through, through your company or through your association, activate the tools that are in there to start there. Zoom just released the AI companion. Um, and I actually went to a session on it yesterday to just learn more about it. They got a lot of heat because they were talking about training on folks' data. But it, where they ended up um, was important because people have to respond to make sure these tools are used in a way that people want them to be. So I would tell people to start where they are. I also interviewed a gentleman on uh, my podcast. His name is Dr. Chappella. He uh, wrote a book called Can We Trust AI? Things like that, reading books or listening to podcasts about that book. Just start by learning because my biggest fear is everyone's going to reject it and then you're going to be left behind. Like yeah. think about Web 1.0 when folks were like, we're not putting our products on online. Right. Amazon started with books. It's so 1995. <laughs> but that's real. Amazon started with books and the companies that did not get on board and get online. Had about 1998, that's for exactly. sure. Web 2.0, <laughs> we get social and how people are interacting. Companies that did not get online are losing money. As we continue to go and continue to develop and whatever Web3 looks like with AI integrations and things like that, we have to make sure our companies and associations have to be responsible for ensuring their membership knows at least how to start using this stuff. We all started with email, then we got a little bit more advanced, then our parents got Facebook, and then whatever it is. Like You have to be able to use these technologies so that you will not get left behind. And if it is starting with ChatGPT, I know you don't want me to say that, but there are other things like Google Bard, Bing, and Claude. other there's technology, ideogram, there's plenty of tech, mid journey, there's plenty of technologies. The, mm -hmm. the last two I mentioned are AI, text to image creators, but there's plenty of hey, tech. Hey, for video, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, on and on and on. And there's so many. Even with my podcast, I use an AI to edit it. Me um, too. It's, it makes so much sense. You can literally save so much productivity with your company. Mm -hmm. And I want you all, just try, just try it, play around with it. If you don't like that one, there's literally now probably a thousand more that you can try. There you go. Amber Ivy, don't miss her. She's the keynote, Association AI Day. Thank you, Amber, and have a great weekend. Thank you, you too. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. See you soon.